They say that hindsight is always twenty twenty, and that one can only get complete understanding of an event after it has happened, although you still had no clue at the time of the event. Join me today in the screening room as we take a look back at a version of Kolshak the Night Stalker that never actually happened. You see, there was a singular decision made during pre-production of the series that set the series on the road to failure even before it began. After the break, we will examine the crossroad and theorize how things might have turned out if that decision had been made differently. If you're anything like me, you've probably heard something like the following story. Jeff Rice wrote three unpublished novels, and they served as the stories for The Night Stalker, The Night Strangler, and The Night Killers, the third movie that was never made. This story is one of Hollywood's great urban legends, where a lowly, unpublished author can show up in Hollywood, sell a script, and have the movie of the week be the most popular movie of all time. It's sort of like the urban legend where they discovered Lana Turner at a soda fountain in Hollywood. Uh, the problem is, it didn't really happen that way. The real story unfolded something like this. One of Jeff's unpublished stories did end up being sold to ABC, but he didn't sell it. He had sent the novel to a Hollywood agent, and that agent then in turn sold the novel to NBC without actually signing Jeff as a client. So Jeff sued ABC over the fact they were using his story without permission. There was a settlement, of course there would be, and they proceeded to make The Night Stalker. In the meantime, ABC had Richard Matheson take the story and turn it into a teleplay, which is a fancy word for TV script. I want to be very clear about something. The story idea was completely Jeff's, and he definitely created a character named Kolshak. But the Kolshak he created is not the one that you and I love today. His Kolshak was superstitious, fat, cowardly, and comparatively humorless. Everything is the opposite of what we've come to know Kolshak for. Matheson took that character and changed it in the teleplay to become the Kolshak we all know and love. However, during filming, apparently Dan Curtis wanted the script changed to include stuff from the unpublished story. Matheson was unavailable, so Jeff was on hand to do the last-minute rewrites. So Jeff definitely had his input into the final script. Now, my point in all of this is most certainly not to downplay Jeff Rice's input into the movies and TV series, but I want us to focus on the fact that when Dan Curtis and Richard Matheson worked together to create the two movies, they did so with exceptionally successful results because they both had been doing so for years. Obviously, everyone knows about Dan Curtis creating Dark Shadows. No surprise there. But not all of you may know the incredibly deep storytelling skills of Richard Matheson, who had written some of the very best horror and sci-fi that has ever been written to date. Consider this. In 1954, he wrote a story called I Am Legend. Then he worked on not one, but two different major motion pictures based on that story. In 1964, he wrote The Last Man on Earth, starring Vincent Price. And then again in 1971, The Omega Man, starring Charlton Heston. He also wrote his first movie teleplay in 1957, The Incredible Shrinking Man. Also went on, by the way, to write 16 episodes of The Twilight Zone, more than anybody else other than Rod Serling himself, including the most famous episode of Twilight Zone of all time, William Shatner's Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. Additionally, he also wrote four different screenplays for Vincent Price based on the works of Edgar Allan Poe, The House of Usher, Pit and the Pendulum, Tales of Terror, and The Raven. And finally, he wrote the screenplays and the stories for The Legend of Hell House in 1971, and he also wrote Duel in 1971, which would be the very first Steven Spielberg film. Honestly, it is no wonder why Michael Eisner assigned him the job of turning the Jeff Rice story into something that would work as an entertaining TV movie. Anecdotally, Dan Curtis would frequently say afterwards that he originally didn't really want to do The Night Stalker until he found out that Richard Matheson had done the screenplay. One final thing to keep in mind is that the title of the script when Matheson wrote it was The Kolshak 
tapes. That's going to sound like a really familiar phrase in a few moments. Now what happened next was so unexpected that even today, almost 50 years later, it still seems remarkable. The movie premiered on a Tuesday night and opposite the very popular Hawaii Five-O TV series. Now, Dan and the network knew they had a good movie. They'd had some test screenings and the audience seemed to like it. But no one was prepared the next morning when the overnight ratings came back, revealing a whopping 54% of all TVs in the United States had watched the movie the previous night. 54% set a new ratings record for televised movies, handily beating its previous record holder. So needless to say, after the first movie was such a tremendous success, ABC wanted two more. Now contrary to popular belief, The Night Strangler was written by Richard Matheson. It was not based on any existing work by Jeff Rice. A third movie, The Night Killers, was written by Matheson and William F. Nolan, another very prolific writer. The script was finished and ready to be shot. But then, ABC had a different idea. They wanted a television series instead. And ABC made a phone call that would forever seal the fate of its new television series. The call was to Dan Curtis. I mean, from ABC's point of view, it made perfect sense. He had just delivered Dark Shadows for over 1,200 episodes to them. He had produced both movies, directed one, was involved in writing the screenplays for both. He had the connections to Richard Matheson and William Nolan. He had everything they needed to run the show. It was a match made in heaven. The problem was, he told them he didn't want the job. So they just lost the producer and the director of the first two movies. His connections with the writers that gave them the scripts. If this show had been a boat, it would have been taking on water fast by this point. So ABC turned to the only remaining person in the entire lot that had any familiarity with the first two movies. And that would be Darren McGavin. So they told him he could be executive producer as well as lead actor. He was quite happy with that. He really was looking forward to getting executive producing credits to go on his resume. Now that boat we were talking about, it's now been identified as the Titanic, and ice has been spotted on the horizon. Darren McGavin ran with it for 20 episodes before he got so frustrated with putting in the time as story editor and executive producer and never getting the credit they promised him, nor any of the money for those roles. He just said, I'm done. I want to be released from my contract. They still had three episodes to film. He was so upset, he walked away from the series. They shut it down, and that was the end of Kolshak the Night Stalker. And for the next 40 to 50 years, the fans would always wonder about a TV series that could have been, but never was. But I found some evidence of what it could have been had it gone forward. So to help illustrate that, I'm going to borrow a trick from Mr. Rod Serling. And we're going to go back and take a look at what could have happened if Dan Curtis had agreed to be the showrunner for the series. You are traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Presented for your entertainment. Exhibit A. The sum content of Season 1 of Kolshak, the Night Stalker frozen precariously in time between what exists and what never did. Now we'll take a look at the potential for season two, compiled from 23 stories in 18 movies that were done by Dan Curtis and Richard Matheson over the next two years. And that alone provides us with stories that very well could have been Kolshak episodes. So let's take a look. Okay, so remember when I told you that the Kolshak tapes would sound familiar to you? Well, here's the story. Right around the same time that he was making The Night Stalker, he was also making another television pilot called The Norless Tapes. <laughs> You're listening to the music now. Sound familiar? The other thing is that The Norless Tapes is about a reporter who's writing a book to debunk supernatural events. He runs across a woman who claims that her husband's been brought back as a zombie. The woman is played by Andy Dickinson. He then disappears, leaving only the recorded tapes that he made as a clue to what happened to him. Very, very similar to the tape recorder that Kolchak used in the original Night Stalker. You'll also notice that Claude Akins even plays a sheriff in this movie, the same sheriff role he played in the Night Stalker movie. 
while he said he didn't want to do a TV series. He tried to sell Minoralist tapes to NBC as a TV series at the exact same time. So obviously he had it in him to do another TV series, but I think he was really banking on the fact that he could take the Norlis tapes further than he could take Kolshak, and he wouldn't have to share the create credit with Jeff Rice. This movie is available on the web. I'm sure you can even find it here on YouTube. I recommend it highly for Kolshak fans. It's probably a good thing it didn't sell to NBC because what we know about Jeff Rice now is that he would have sued Dan Curtis over it. Next up is Dan Curtis's Dracula, which has two major claims to fame. One, it established that Dracula and Vlad Tepish, Vlad the Impaler, were one and the same person. Had never been done, was not in the original Bram Stoker novel. Dan Curtis created that, and since then, every Dracula version, including Kevin Bronick's Dracula, have done the same thing. And the second thing it introduced is that it was a reincarnation of his lost love, that became a key story point of the movie. This was borrowed directly from the Barnabas Collins, Josette Collins storyline from Dark Shadows, but also has become a staple for vampire movies. Now, the next thing we're going to take a look at is Trilogy of Terror. This was a movie that contained three stories that was introduced in 1975 that was guaranteed 100% to scare the living crap out of you. Most people became aware for the very first time of what a Zuni doll looked like. And just about all of us that watched it ended up having nightmares. Karen Black played a role in all three short stories. She was absolutely exquisite, although she became heavily typecast. In her later years in her life, she admitted that it pretty much trapped her in horror, and that's not where she wanted to be. Please note, this is only one of two times in history that a movie of the week contained a parental advisory disclaimer. Consider this, with only a wooden puppet... Dan Curtis could terrorize an entire generation. This little bugger you can see right now on the screen is responsible for more nightmares than just about every other horror movie that was produced in the 1970s. Trust me, he's going to be your dreams tonight. You're welcome. And finally, in addition to the 18 movies that I've referenced earlier, there were television shows on the scene such as Circle of Fear and Ghost Story, same thing, Night Gallery, and The Sixth Sense that also worked in episodic individual stories week to week. So Dan Curtis definitely could have filled the entire second season and beyond had he chosen to do so. And so there you have it. Once again on the screen are the 18 movies that Dan Curtis and Richard Matheson were involved in within two years of Kolshak. Any and all of them could have been converted to episodes. But that's not what happened. As we slowly return from our voyage into the Twilight Zone, you see the original Season 1 20 episodes suddenly reappear. This is all you and I have of Kolchak, the Night Stalker. But I'll tell you this. From this moment on, every time you see Trilogy of Terror and you see the Zuni doll, you'll think of what could have been. Rest in peace, Kolchak. We miss you. And now I'll leave you with the late, great Karen Black as Amelia. Proving to us that she will not let a wooden puppet steal the stage.